I'm sitting with Linda Derry. Linda Derry is the, for the next day? Rest of today. Yeah, rest of today is the director of Okahaba Archaeological Park. And she has, after 40 years, you decided to retire. Golly, that is amazing. Well, they told me I was losing money by working. <laughs> I thought I'd be here until I die, and then of course I got married, and he would kind of like me to live with him. But really, other than really? that, it was really, yeah, because I love this place, you know, I love this oh, place. Oh, yeah. And I, I love the people that have really supported it over the years. You've done a lot here, too, over the years, as a matter of fact. Let's, but, let's talk a little bit about that, too. Go ahead. What you well, it's not me. It's, I mean, the Cahaba Foundation. I mean, everybody's right. helped. Remember the old Cahaba days? Oh, yeah, money? yeah. Um, just, it's a Boy Scouts, you right. know, it's just been a, it takes a village, as I say. And oh, yeah. This certainly has been, I've been very proud to be associated with the people that love this place and have worked hard. Well, you, you built a team and uh, your team has done really well over the years. Yeah, and that's, the that's a sign of a good leader is to be able to build a team <laughs> and, and know who can do things and, yeah. you know, delegate their responsibilities yeah. so that everything gets done. And I'm, I, I think that's what's happened here over the years. Uh, you came in 1985. What was it like in 1985? Well, there wasn't any flush toilets down here. That's the big accomplishment. No flush, no toilets. flush toilets for several years. <laughs> so that's real dedication to hang out where there's no flush toilets. Yeah. But um, I mean, can I be honest with you? Uh, please. And, and your viewers. Yeah. I showed up in Selma, Alabama. I moved here from Colonial Williamsburg in right. Virginia, and I there was. Mayor Smitherman was in place. Right. Uh, Carl Morgan, people might remember, was city council oh, yeah. president. They thought they were in charge. But there's a group <laughs> of women that I called the Dragon Ladies. Uh oh. And they included uh, Betty Calloway and Elise Blackwell, and they've passed away now. But they were really behind the scenes, making sure Selma looked like a lovely right. place. And, and they were behind Cahaba 100%. Wow. Yeah. But they were scary. I remember. <laughs> I I I came into they put me in this office. I was all by myself, no right. staff, in the John Tyler Morgan house. Right. And I had a little desk and I was sitting up by computer and this the door swings open and here comes at least back while boom, 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 <laughs> boom. And she gets up and she sits on my desk and crosses her legs and proceeds to tell me what I am gonna do. Now, I have no idea who she is. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work for her, but I ended up working for her. Uh -huh, I mean, but right. yeah, they were uh, a dynamite. And uh, I often feel now at this age, uh, I shouldn't be a dragon lady, but <laughs> no. they didn't leave an instruction manual. So. <laughs> well, and, and that story, that, that's one of the things that's so uh, endearing about you is your storytelling. You, <laughs> you do that so well. We're going to get to that in just a second. But um, so since you've been here, there have been changes. You, you got flush toilets. You got a little. We have flush toilets. Yeah, yeah, and um, the people of Alabama, the state of Alabama, actually own nothing down here other than the right of ways. Wow, uh, really? Because the federal government gave the square mile to the state, and they sold off the lots, right. but never the some of the town commons, the cemeteries, mm -hmm. graveyard was never left, and you can't adversely possess against the state. So we. The lawyers maintained the right of ways were still belong to the state of Alabama. Oh, okay. um, so we had to try to buy all this land back. And it was very difficult mm -hmm. because people just up and left after the Civil War. So mm -hmm. now each little tiny half acre was owned by 45 people. And oh, wow. a lot of them were underage or right. mentally incompetent. And so the lawyers made a lot of money off of us <laughs> trying to clear the title so we could purchase the lot. But you got how much, what's the percentage of the, original town that the state now owns um, well we own over 600 acres and there's just two big tracks we could ever get left mm -hmm. so i don't, I don't maybe, know what the maybe percentage is the, and then yeah. there's a south end that we will never get um uh, and it's been you know sort of bulldozed away so it is an archaeological park and that's the neat thing about this yeah. is um other towns go on to be developed, and so they put in airports and Walmart mm -hmm, shopping right. centers, and it's, the history is destroyed. But here, they just walked away, and the record of all their lives, all the buildings, you just peel back the soil, and there's the foundation of where a house stood or a yeah. church. And 
and all of our garbage. <laughs> yeah, which is the coolest stuff. Which too. is the coolest stuff? Because you know, if you read the documents, right? Somebody wrote that document. It's usually like a wealthy white guy, yeah. right? Uh huh. And all the rest of us aren't there, but all of us make garbage. Yeah. And you know, I've said this to you before. If you don't believe that's a good source of information, tonight sneak over and go through your neighbor's garbage can. Right. And you'll learn a lot more about them than they would ever tell you. That's right. And so old garbage, but it's garbage, but it's very democratic. Everybody's represented in it. That's right. And things that you might want to hide. I mean, I've in a past life uh, digging somewhere as an archaeologist, I have found a revolver with one bullet missing in uh, the remains of an outhouse. Oh. And lots of bottles that people threw in the outhouse. They didn't know yeah. anybody, you know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, and and, yeah. and my family, they a lot of them were Quakers, so they're not military people. They're not. They're just common folks. And right. so, I guess that's why I became archaeologist because I want to know what the everyday life was like. What the common that's what I always loved about too, yeah. and and that's why I've been. Uh, you know, I always like to tell people that, that you can read the history books all day long. But until you go and touch it and feel it, when you actually go to a place like this and you see the uh, the visitor center, which is a house from here, you see the church, which is a church from here, and you, like when we did the, the, the archaeology, landscape. you see yeah. that, the landscape, you see the holes where houses are found, then it starts to come alive. And, you know, you know it's like they save all these battlefields. That Why? It's because until you walk where the ancestors walk, right. you will never understand what they've written down yeah. like here it was like oh the the state house flooded blah 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 mm -hmm. well you know they record how high the water got well the state house was first floor was three feet off the ground mm -hmm. right? right so it had to get above three feet to get in the state house uh -huh. and and then you go look and see where it stood and it's going down into a ravine so of course, when it flooded up in the ravine, it's a sort of a semicircle. Yeah. The legislators might have had to row across that to get to the state house, but the water, you know, there's a fourth grade textbook I look at the rowing in the second story window. That would have happened all of Alabama would have been underwater. Yeah, the whole state you know. would have been. <laughs> but, but we did later had flooding, but people compress that history, and we all yeah. love a story about a great flood, too. Well, and yeah, that's true. And and uh, again, the, the history books don't always record the real. Right. And that's why we have people like yourself, archaeologists, <laughs> who, you know. But even if you have the original document written at the time by somebody, you need to take it to the historical place and read it in the context. And yeah. you'd be surprised how the landscape and lay of the land will tell you, well, oh, now I understand what they're saying. Right. So I do. And there's something spiritual, too, about walking oh, where the ancestors walk. I, there is a certain ambiance, a certain uh, atmosphere when you come, as soon as you come through the gates at the front. This is a magical place. It very much so is. And you walk in here, you ride in here. Uh, there's something about this place. You, I, I can, I, I feel the past. Yeah, and you know, you know, there's so many ghost stories about this place. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a scientist, so I'm very skeptical about uh -huh. it. But, uh, things happen, you just don't know. But part of me, I think, there's people, oh, nature reclaimed Cahaba. Well, no, if you look around you, the privet is from China, you know, <laughs> and right. um, the daffodils that come up in the spring and the roses, right. and so there's very little natural. And I think we kind of record the runes. Um, you kind of see that out of the corner of your eye, and you, you don't really notice it, but your subconscious does. Mm -hmm. You realize that those are little messages left behind by these long dead residents to tell us about what they thought was beautiful or, you know, where, you know. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. I know exactly what I'm about. I hope everybody else understands too because they need to come check, check this they out. They do. This and, and just get out of your car. Yeah. Slow down. Open your eyes and look for those clues and come to the visitor center and we've got a explorer guy that will tell you about some clues you can mm -hmm. look for or just talk to us and we'll, we'll clue you in. Tell us what you're interested in and, and the staff here will... And I got a great staff. I don't believe it. <laughs> but I'll still be around. I'm actually going to come back and work part time. That's on right. Special yeah. projects. That'll be good. Yeah. And, and the Honda History Tour and the. And, oh yeah, stuff. I will. yeah. I'll come back and tell my personal experience. Oh yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about a little bit what you have done since you've been here, because you got flush toilets for one thing. Got flush toilets. But since you've been here, 
the visitor center was moved into position and the church. So tell us about those. Right. Well, um, <laughs> when I first came here, I visited these two sort of maiden aunt ladies living in Hazen mm -hmm. and their house. And um, they, they told me that <laughs> their house, their father and the uncle were both born in the house, but one was born when the house was in Hazen and one was born when it, ha it was in a little town called Fulton that doesn't exist anymore. Oh, wow. But before that, it came from Cahaba. When Cahaba died, oh. they, well, half of Selma's historic district right. at least was made out of houses or parts of houses right. taken from Cahaba and big buildings like the churches. And, but um, anyway, so the Kelly house and when they passed away, next time I looked, it was gone, and somebody had moved it to Valley Grand. So this house oh, went wow. from Cahaba to Fulton to Hazen to Valley Grand, and then it was sold on eBay. And the guy who bought it was going to take it to New Jersey. Oh, and wow. I couldn't let that happen, so I contacted the buyer and seller and just made him feel real guilty. <laughs> and they actually sold it to us for less than what he bid it. Oh, on. wow. And then it sat there until we could raise the money with the mm -hmm. helps of, um, you know, our friends. And we brought it back and set it up. And it became our new visitor center because our first one got hit by lightning and burnt to the ground. Oh, wow. But it was a reproduction. And this is actually original house. It stood in an adjacent lot. Yeah. This was the home. The lot was for Senator John Tyler Morgan and his house is in Selma. So, but they look very much alike. So John Tyler Morgan actually lived on this lot. He lived on this, that, that very lot. Yes, that I'll was it. it. The house faced another direction. Yeah. But and it had um, big magnolia trees in front of it. Oh, cool. Yeah. And now tell us about the church. The church has had a pretty interesting history as well. Yeah. And of course, this isn't the original spot. No. The original spot's down there by your flush toilets. By, yeah. <laughs> it was near the river and it was built. It's the first of its kind in Alabama, Gothic mm -hmm. Revival. And you see churches like this that look like that now, right. that Gothic Revival church. Um, but it was the first. And I think it was the first because Cahaba had the, um, the bishop's son-in-law. Oh. Was the, the, Right. Preacher that was here. That's not the right word. I can't think yeah. of the Episcopalians, what they call them. But um, they built it uh, near the river, so all the steamboats, everybody going by, would see it. Oh, and then they would yeah. build other churches like it. And right. indeed, we have a lot of Gothic Revival we churches do. now. Yeah. But it's funny that um, there was a famous architect that did a design book mm -hmm. to send out to the frontier to places <laughs> like Alabama so we know how to do it correctly. Right. Yeah. And, but he didn't, word, have, um, <laughs> he didn't have these, uh, what's the word of the, the little pieces coming up the side? Flying buttresses. Buttresses. Yeah. He didn't have that. The Cahaba folks added the buttresses. Oh. And now that's become, you know, part the of, thing, yeah. yeah, and a lot of churches have the buttresses. They also made it bigger mm -hmm. and it's missing a spire. And yeah. the architect's um, grandson saw it and he said, oh, it's all out of proportion. It looks like a magnified candle snuffer. <laughs> he didn't like it at all. But. <laughs> See, this is what the Kaaba folks are like here. Yeah. You know, I say they're militia, you know, those big Shaco kind of hats. Mm -hmm. they, you'd either have a pom-pom or a feather. Well, they had oh. a pom-pom and a feather. Oh, they got them both. Yeah, they had them mm -hmm. both. And they knew better and they were, this is a very wealthy community. Um, it was the county seat for Dallas County just yeah. 1866. And in 1860 had the fourth highest per capita wealth in the whole United States. Wow. So these were the wealthiest of the wealthy and all their enslaved laborers. It was always a majority black community right. too, which is kind of unusual for towns of that period. Um, so, and even yeah. you can see we still have a standing- this is after it was the state capital. Oh yes, you know, yeah. people think, oh, the state capital, there was a horrible right. flooding. Well, 1825 was a drought year, so all that's myth. <laughs> but right. it was a frontier capital. Mm -hmm. More like gun smoke and gone with the wind. Right. Everybody was living in cabins. They took the, the, you know, they took it away. But this town, Governor Bibb was right. He selected a good place with the confluence of two rivers right, and the cotton yeah. belt. So it just took a little longer to go from nothing right. to um, a fine town. So by 1860, oh my gosh, this is the wealthy of the wealthiest. And then, of course, uh, by 1860, but you would think that when the capital was moved to Tuscaloosa that the the town would die, but actually it saw more. It started at Kilmer right yeah. back because it was based, of course, all on cotton and slavery. Right. But but it did. It, it quickly, you know, took advantage. Merchants came from New York to take advantage of the mm -hmm. cotton planters that were coming in. They'd bring them 
the supplies that they needed and they'd give them their cotton and they'd ship them down the river and we had two big cotton warehouses where they'd store them wow. there and yeah. Well, let's get back to the church real quick. Where did it go? Where did it, when it, it went, left here, where did it go? It went to Martin Station with, mm -hmm. when after the Civil War, this town rapidly went down. Yeah. It was a Freedman's Village for a little while, but since Reconstruction ended and the federal troops left, those people dissipated too. Mm -hmm. And so there was Episcopalian here that yeah. moved it to where they, near their plantation. Right. It never much made it, it didn't really make it as a church, mm -hmm. but it stood that way. And about 1931, they let the black tenant farmers use it to worship wow. in it, and it began yeah. as Zion Baptist Church. Right. So it has a varied history. And then it was moved back from Martin Station back to here. Yes, I think about 2008, but don't yeah. quote me on that. And architecture students brought it back. That's cool. They took it apart. And I, you know, I'm an ancient woman, gray hair, <laughs> but you go and you see these like young female <laughs> architecture students. And if you go inside, there's these huge arches yeah. and they figured out how to take those things down without killing anybody. <laughs> you know, and really. then put it back together. Well, actually, they brought it back, and we had to bring somebody else, another crew, in to put wow. it back together. But that what they did was amazing. Yeah. And we found how did they move it from here in the first place? That was a good question. Yeah. But we found they had numbered all the arches, so they put them all back oh. together. So they had Roman numerals. Each arch is, has a different number. How cool. So they actually took it apart, brought it over there, and put it back up. And the same is the case in Selma. We're finding that. You know, people would buy bricks. They buy mm -hmm. frames of the structure, and so you might see there's one, two little cottages that I've been told was once first and second story of a house here. But you can see it's got those early federal fan lights. Right. But then it's got later Italianate brackets all over oh, it. So when yeah. they moved it, they updated it. Right, right. So, but it's still parts of Cahaba. Yeah. I, I often think of it like their sister communities. Right. This is the older sister, and then when Sister went away to college or whatever. <laughs> Little baby sister comes and Took raised over. the closet, you know. So um, <laughs> that's a good way to look at. Yeah. But I, I remember when the uh, the um, uh, the Masons had their ceremony down here. You were telling me that there's some evidence that the uh, the church hall over at uh, Our Lady Queen of Peace was originally yeah, that beautiful, the Masonic yeah, lodge. The, um, St. Andrews. Andrews. Roof. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's very well documented. That's there's a newspaper article about here come here comes from wow. Cahaba because they float it, you know, take yeah. barges or whatever and, and take up. And um, part of the Episcopal Church, um, their hall is so both part of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and the Episcopal Church. I'm sorry, is that what you said, Episcopal? No, it's a Catholic Church. All right, yeah. so both. Yeah. Both parts, um, their halls are, um, and it was a boys' school originally, right. it was a Catholic boys' school, I believe. But but so those are well documented. Yeah. But, there's others, I mean, that like, oh, here comes the frame of the house. Again, if this keeps up shortly, Cahaba will be out of business. That's mm -hmm. written in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So there's so many houses. Somebody just came to me um, yesterday and is like, well, I don't know if we can prove that your house came from here, but it's very likely mm -hmm. because there's just innumerable. Um, but you, you talk about the little differences like the uh, the early and then the Italian later and then St. Andrews is actually facing the wrong way. <laughs> and when we first came here and I went, well, why is that house backwards? <laughs> well, that explains it. It wasn't originally there. And so they adjusted it to fit their needs. Yeah. And, and that's that's what you've been doing all these years is finding those little details and putting back together the history of this and, area. You know, that's. You know, a lot of it is research that uh -huh. I do or my staff does, but people in Selma come up with stuff and show it to us. Um, when I retire, I want to write a community history of yeah. Cahaba, but it really will be written by a community of descendants mm -hmm. and, and people That's that cool. know, you know, they bring diaries, letters, pictures. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Well, so, the other thing that was, happened while you were here, the archaeology on the original uh, which my son and I got to be a part of, and that was fascinating because I love doing archaeology anyway. But how often were you able to do any digs? Because I, I got to go back. 
in 86 or 7, the University of Alabama expedition. had their expedition. And I first met you back then yeah. when you were just fresh here. And I believe the dig was actually the foundations of this church. Yes, it was. And Part of it. Yeah. We, and, uh, the state only owned 20 acres. Oh, and so right. that's what we were concentrated on. And we discovered the foundation of the church. We discovered it, it was one of those anniversaries of De Hernando de Soto. Right. And all the prehistorians were going up and down the river, and they never thought to look at Cahaba because, you know, it's obviously <laughs> right. disturbed. But, in fact, most of the houses were on piers, so the remains are better preserved than where they were looking, where they had plowed up. Right. Uh, so, anyway, so I'm waving at them. And then we're doing test units, and it's like, look at all this aboriginal pottery. And it, it's everywhere. And then, and then all of a sudden, it disappears, and it was in a sort of semicircular uh -huh. pattern. Hmm, there must have been a palisade. Oh, wow. And so I went and talked to them, and so they, they then sent researchers here. Right. And the expedition program, as you know, I just, oh my gosh, I can't mm. believe, sorry, editorial comment, that um, the university museums did away with that program because Don't what they would do, <laughs> well, you know, they would take a group of students, right. teachers, uh, interested adults, and they'd go someplace. And without, if they were with me, you're, I'm with a professional historical archaeologist. Right. Next year, they'd be with a paleontologist. Right. And or a prehistorian. Not only did the students learn something, and 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 many of them went on to those careers. Mm -hmm. They also helped an archaeologist who didn't have the resources and the funds to get the work done, and now the work got done. Yeah, and, and, from, my, you know. and from my opinion, from the professional standpoint, you know, everybody wants to find arrowheads and, oh, yeah. and, and metal detect, but if you go out on your own and you dig, you're destroying, it's like walking Ooh. where the ancestors walked, but what those artifacts are associated with and the soil layers they are, that's what so people if you need to dig, understand. you're yeah. destroying that. But if you went to expedition program, you got to work with a professional and you see how it works. So then you right. understand what's the right way to do it. And if you don't do it, what you're losing. Exactly. Because these are still, all these people that lived here, there's lots of stories that didn't make it in. They're untold stories and they're just waiting to be told. But if you destroy them, they'll never be told. Right. Somebody, I also feel that way when houses go down, historic houses, because they're oh, there gosh. on the landscape and that's so house. Now yeah. it's gone and they're, they're forgotten. Well, are you going to continue uh, as in retirement? Will you continue to do that kind of research? Oh, yes. And, you know, I want to write this book and mm -hmm. I have some archaeology stuff that I've been too busy with other things right, here right. to write up the reports. But one of my first assignments is going to be, you know, next year is the anniversary of the grand tour of general lafayette right yeah and april 5th he came to cahaba he toured the all of the states that were mm -hmm. in the united states at that time but he came here because this was the capital and so we're going to try to mount a celebration oh cool and it, it's going to yeah. be so cool and you know i never really got about lafayette until i started reading and he was amazing mm. he was he believed in uh, and the common good for everybody, right. blacks, whites, women, everybody. Yeah. So we all should share. It's, Very modern. All of us are equal. <laughs> yeah. And he really took steps towards abolition, towards women's rights. Um, so he was an amazing man. And so we're in the planning stage right now. But it's it'll be here before you know it. And and if you want to volunteer, we need a bunch of people that will be oh. in period costumes. So we need to start That'd towing now. That will be fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. That will be fun. So what, what would you want your predecessor? Is there anything that you have not finished or oh, any projects that you would like that maybe you want your predecessor, hope that your predecessor yeah, would? I hope that when they hired me, they wanted a historical archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping my predecessor is a historical archaeologist who can also deal with the public and yeah, deal with there's the genealogy. Because yeah. quite frankly, when I came here, I'd always worked in a museum or um, academic. Right. Know, and right. it's like we you party with the same people and we always talk about archaeology and but I got here and it's like I was a social cripple. <laughs> I didn't know how to talk about football and they'd ask me what I do and I'd say archaeology and they'd kinda of glaze over like, Is that dinosaurs or <laughs> Right. Yeah. I don't know. So and a quick distinction. Dinosaurs are paleontologists. Yes. Human remains and houses and buildings are archaeologists. Yes, yes. And I'm a historic archaeologist, so I don't do arrowheads.
I did grandma's china. Yeah. So. <laughs> but um, <laughs> or the state house china. <laughs> yeah, or the state house whiskey yeah. bottles. Yeah, that's a story. Oh, we got to do on another another <laughs> video. But, but yes, I want somebody that um, yeah. So I want somebody that ha that has the passion for the significance of the site, right. which is really archaeological and the landscape. Um, the agency I work for, the Alabama Historical Commission, does mm -hmm. a lot of good preservation stuff, but they also have other sites in their buildings and forts, but this is about the relic landscape. Yeah. And especially in the South, boy, there's stories embedded in the relic landscape, yeah. and we need to appreciate those too. But the things I'd like to see that haven't gotten done is Governor Bibb had this grand landscape plan mm -hmm. that he incorporated this relic Native American landscape yes. in as a centerpiece. He was going to... He wanted to put the state house atop the ceremonial Indian mound. Right. But they didn't give him enough money. They spent, they gave him, here's $10,000 to build temporary accommodations mm -hmm. for our first state house. Come back in 1825 and we'll do that. But, um, of course, he died and that never <laughs> happened. But, um, but, but it's, that's how he sold the lots and that's how he funded Alabama's first treasury. So for people to see that in the landscape, because they graded with the mound and they filled in the moat. So somehow bring that semicircle back mm -hmm. so people can appreciate the layers of history and yeah. that, how magnificent and symbolic that was that he created a uh, state capital with an A, capital C, right. with this symbolic centerpiece at, X, this, at Capitol Street, extra wide, which he thought would look at the end would be our beautiful state house yeah. atop this ceremonial Indian mound. And the grounds of the state house would be circumscribed by a moat that had been dug by the Native right. Americans around 1500. How cool, cool is that? Been, yeah. But even better now, he had to move over and they gave him $10,000. They spent That's almost $20,000 yeah. on a party for Lafayette. <laughs> so I showed you how much that was. So he moved over on the adjacent lot and so built this building. And for years, people have been seeing these pictures of these buildings. And so he built a ghost structure mm -hmm. to show the yeah. size and shape of it. But when, again, you gotta let archaeologists get in there and do the work. We found out that our state house is really trapezoidal, right. not rectangular. So I'd like to see somehow to reintroduce, move that front wall out somehow yeah. so people understand. We have a sign we're putting up to understand how science works. And, right. You know, you might think this, but then you find something else. But I'd like to see that semicircle. Governor Bibb's intent for this town brought back because it was so important and uh, the, the true structure of the state house shown. But his layout was so, uh, just guided everything here mm -hmm. that, you know, cemeteries, you know, the cemetery yeah. that oh, we're yeah. in the haunted history. Well, most Christian cemeteries are oriented to the east because when Christ comes back, he's right. going to be in the east. So we all got to set up towards him. Right. Our cemetery is 20 degrees off of east because the town plan was 20 degrees oh. off of east. So, so that was so a, overriding yeah. that they, even that cemetery that's much later, they still were following his plan. For, oh, for, be darned. For, yeah. Isn't that cool? Those are the cool things that you can learn by coming here yeah. and seeing it and yeah. talking to folks. And especially like come, you know, look on our, our Facebook page, the calendar of events. At generally the first weekend mm -hmm. of every month, we have some kind of guided tour. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it's a, Bring, you know, BYOB, bring your own bike, and yeah. take bike and, which is a great way to see this place. Oh, yeah. And get some exercise and have some history at the same time. And Or we have a bird walk for beginners. We have a Civil War tour. We have a Road to Freedom tour that yeah. I think is really interesting. You know, so Haunted History. Oh, the Haunted October. History in October is awesome. I love it. I can't yeah. wait. And I look forward to that every year. And we don't make up stories. Nope. We tell the traditional tales, yep. and there's a lot of history in that. And some of these tales... That been handed down will look and like those are real people and they really did go where they said mm -hmm, they went yeah. so it's very interesting you know i could sit here and talk to you all afternoon and i know you got work to do and so do i but let's make some more videos about this yes. place and about some more of the history that you've learned since you've people, been here let's try to get people to come down here and support this place yes. and love this place because it's not just history we feel like come down there and photograph butterflies um, right and bird, bird watching birds, and yeah ghosts you know, we have horse like, riding, horse, we, oh, horseback well, riding, yeah. yeah. So, um, bring you know. your own BYOH, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just want you to love this place and yeah. be passionate about it for whatever reason. There's a lot of reasons, and it's magical. It is magical, it's, you know. 
it seems like wherever I go, there's somebody, another state, there's some connection to Cahaba. Maybe the prisoners of war that were held here. Yeah. yeah. But so I, we decided a long time ago that it was either the center of the universe <laughs> or the gateway to hell. <laughs> but either one, it's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. And not only. Thank you for, for all that you've done for Cahaba. Well, well, and I, I want to keep doing it, and especially. You know, you you are a personal friend as well, and uh, my, my family just absolutely loves you, aside from the work you've done here. But thank you for what you've done here because history is so important, and if we had more people like you working for places like this, then we would probably be able to take care and preserve a lot more history that unfortunately we lose too well, easily. There's so. a community of people that yeah. just need somebody to try to pull them together. And, you know, Maybe we'll I'm like a that. pit bull yeah. of uh, preservation. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, no. Because it well, took like 40 years to get to this point. I don't know if I'd call you Pitbull, but. <laughs> but, you know, people have been trying to save it since like 1908. Yeah. And it was just so difficult. So the people that in this thing, I hope it keeps going after I leave and doesn't fall back. Into, right. But it just keeps building because it's such an amazing place. Well, I, I will stand behind him and kick him in the rear end. Okay. Of okay. And don't forget, you can also find out a lot of the information about what's going on here on the uh, Black Belt News Network Facebook page because we usually have stories about all the events. So thank you so much. I love you. Todd. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Todd Prater with the Black Belt News Network. Check us out at blackbeltnewsnetwork.com on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok.